As we take a tour of the Redwood National Park in Northern California, we are bound to be awestruck by a mere glance of the giant redwood trees. Their height of over 380 feet makes them the world's tallest trees. But ever wondered how they maintain the uniformity? How is it that a redwood tree grows to an unimaginable height but still has the same wood and similar leaves throughout? Let me give you another example. Take the case of human beings. If we are wounded, then the affected area gets healed in a few days. And we can see that the newer skin is exactly the same as the previous one. How is all this possible? It is because of the process of cell division. This is an extremely interesting process in which the cell makes almost an exact copy of itself. And how is it able to make its replica? All thanks to the process of DNA replication. With this, the cell is able to make a copy of itself. We know that DNA encodes everything. So when the cell is about to divide, the replication of DNA helps in conserving the genetic information. As a result, the newly formed cells carry the same genetic information. Thus, in order to have similar or identical cells, the process of DNA replication and cell division are extremely important. Let's understand how this miraculous process of DNA replication works. Way back in time, there were three major hypotheses of the methods of replication put forth. One method is called the conservative method, the other is called the dispersive method and the last one is called the semi-conservative method. But which of the methods describe the replication process correctly? Which method is used by DNA to make copies of itself? Let's find that out. But before we get to the answer, we need to understand the structure of a typical DNA molecule. This is how it looks. This is the backbone of the DNA molecule and this part forms the core. Now let's understand a few more interesting concepts regarding the DNA molecule. Let's begin with the backbone first. Can you guess how these two strands are arranged? Is there any way to differentiate between these two? Yes, there is. The two complementary DNA strands are antiparallel. And what does this mean? Well, in biochemistry, two units like these strands are said to be antiparallel if they run parallel to each other, but in the opposite direction. So, is there directionality, that is, end-to-end -end alignment, in the case of DNA? Yes, there is. Let's understand the directionality in the DNA molecule better in the next part. Here is a typical structure of a DNA molecule. To understand how exactly it replicates, we need to first understand its detailed structure. To begin with, let's zoom in further. We find a structure somewhat like this. These are the representations of the nitrogenous bases, while these are that of the sugar phosphate backbones. Can you state the difference between these two backbones? It's quite simple. If you notice properly, the ribose sugars in this strand are pointing upwards, while here they are facing downwards. To be precise, the oxygen atoms in these sugar molecules are headed upwards, while in these ones they are headed downwards. So doesn't it seem that these two strands are running in opposite directions? Yes, they are. This is why the two strands are said to be antiparallel. Is this the only reason why we say that the two strands are antiparallel? Actually not. There is a specific way to read the directions of the two strands. And that comes not only from the sugar molecules, but also from the phosphate groups. Let's understand how. We know that the phosphate groups are attached to the sugars with the help of phosphodiester linkages. Now the interesting part is that these linkages occur at specific positions only. 
In every sugar molecule, the phosphate groups are attached at the third carbon atom and the fifth carbon atom only. So in this strand of DNA, we can see that this phosphate group is attached to this fifth carbon atom of the sugar molecule, while this phosphate is attached to the third. Also, it's attached to the fifth carbon atom of the next sugar molecule. This is how the phosphate groups link the sugar molecules together at the fifth and the third carbon atoms. So for a layman, the strand would look like this. A phosphate group, fifth carbon atom, third carbon atom, phosphate group, fifth carbon atom, third carbon atom and so on. So the fifth carbon atom to which the phosphate group is attached is called 5' prime carbon and the third carbon atom to which a free hydroxyl group is attached is called 3' prime carbon. To simplify this, in a DNA strand, this end is referred to as the 5' prime end while this is the 3' prime end. But why is the term prime used here? It's simply to distinguish these carbon atoms from the ones which are involved in linkages with the nitrogenous bases. Getting back to our explanation, this is the 5' prime end while this is the 3' prime end. The 5' prime end has the phosphate group attached to it while the 3' prime end has a free hydroxyl group. So the direction of the strand can be read as 5' prime to 3' prime from the free phosphate group to the free hydroxyl group. Now can you guess the direction of the other strand? Give it a shot. That's correct. The direction of this strand will be read as 3' prime to 5'. Prime. That's because in this strand it begins with a 3' prime end having the free hydroxyl group and ends with the 5' prime end having the phosphate group. This is how the two strands are said to be anti-parallel with respect to each other. Now tell me, how is this complex looking DNA molecule replicated? We had seen that there were three theories put forth to understand the DNA replication process. They were the conservative, dispersive and semi-conservative theory. But which amongst the three is the correct one? Let's understand this in the upcoming parts.